Right, so uh, Nick and I are, uh, Nick Ruay and myself on, uh, at York University of Monday, Alaska, and from McMaster University, both in Ontario and Canada. And we're here to talk about the Ontario Library Research Cloud. And I have to apologize in advance to, to at least David. Um, this is a, uh, an extended version of a talk that I gave at PASIC. So if the slides are familiar and some of the words sound the same, that is not incidental. It might actually be quite intentional. So uh, i got to keep these two machines in, uh, in order here. After that talk by Amadeo yesterday, I really wanted to redo this slide and create this horrifically complicated roadmap. But this is really all we're going to talk about. Sort of how we came up with the idea, how we got it started, a, a really quick technical overview, talk about where it is as a work in progress. And then the two things I think we're going to emphasize are the pricing structure for our cloud, what we're charging ourselves, what we might charge others, since that seems to be an important point these days. And last, uh, a, a bit about governance and participation. And the, the purpose, the underlying purpose of this talk, and the reason that um, we're out talking about the, this is that, number one, we, we think we have a model, we have a way of doing things that are worth talking about because we did things inexpensively and, and rather uh, simply and created a good price point. On the other hand, doing it that way brings with it some challenges in terms of things like participation um, and, and buy-in from some of the partners. Oddly, when you don't pay, you don't commit. So there's, there's something uh, of a double-edged sword here at work. So before I uh, go any further, I'm going to decode some acronyms because they're sort of necessary to tell the story. And if I keep saying them over and over again, you'll just get really confused. So uh, in Ontario, uh, we built the OLR, the Ontario Library Research Cloud. I tend to pronounce it as OLR. Um, Eleven partners. It's a it's an off it's a subset of OCL, which is the Ontario Council of University Libraries. There are 21 university libraries in Ontario alone, uh, of which 11 built. This, this cloud uh, in a in sort of a loose coalition inside the, the larger membership. And Opal supports Scholars Portal, which is a service agency, if you will, a service provider. Um, they're based in Toronto, at the University of Toronto physically. Um, but they do things like shared collections and technology infrastructure. And they, they in particular, in this case, operate the, the OLR core. So they're the, I would say, the, the core technical team behind the OLR. And a whole suite of, of Scholars Portal services ranging from uh, share link resolvers to geo portals, you name it. They do a lot of substantial things uh, for uh, Opal. And I emphasize this because they're, they're a big part of what allows us to do certain things in Ontario at, at scale um, in terms of collaboration. Um, so the, as the title promises, this did not, uh, this is not one of these things that took eight years to gestate and, and become a, a, a full-blown uh, project. Um, the original idea, if I'm getting this history right, and Nick's standing here, so I have to get it right, uh, it started between Nick and a colleague who at that time was a scholar's portal who now works at the University of Toronto. They pulled me in, and so it was just literally a loose conversation in 2012. And we wrote the, the beginning, the, the first draft of a proposal, which became a more full-blown draft, which went to the Oval Directors, which got approved. And then in summer 2013, we had this interesting funding accident, which has had uh, an upside and a downside. The upside is we got a big whack of money, and we were able to build this without actually investing the money that the partners have committed. So all of us have committed to put funds in to build this. When the money came in, we were allowed to sort of just get a free pass on, on a fairly substantial commitment of funds. The, the downside to it was that we ended up building a much larger storage array than we had originally planned. And that sounds like a good thing, except that it led to some confusion about what the two parts of the storage array are that are just now being sort of taken out of the world. So um, it, it's a good and bad thing when, when a ministry comes along and hands you uh, a seven-figure sum to do something. But I mean, ultimately, come on, I mean, it was a pretty cool thing. Um, in 2014, it went out to RFP. That, that was the, uh, the purchase round um, and the deployment, so going out to the various nodes. Uh, 2015 saw final testing, and we've been in production since October of 2015. And in 2016, as the slide says, the fun part starts, and that's kind of what we're here to talk about, which is actually, ironically, getting people to use a distributed storage cloud. You think it would just be one of those, if you build it, they will come things. It turns out maybe not quite to be that case. So um, we'll get into that later. Um, well, as I mentioned briefly, there are five distributed geographical nodes of this. And so the idea is that this is a preservation-ready array. You know, you've got enough distance between the nodes that you can understand anything about some sort of science fiction, Jared Markheimer uh, disaster event. I just had a conversation at a last night at dinner with several people um, who were challenging me on this and said, well, how far apart are your farthest nodes? And I said, they're about 420 kilometers apart. And they said, well, what about an earthquake? And this was somebody who lived on the US, I'm sorry, the Canadian West Coast, where there's sort of the, the, the ring of fire, which is supposed to like, fall off into the ocean in the next you know, 
geologic age, whatever that is. And I said, well, number one, we don't live in a technologically active part of the world. And really, if there's something that comes along that wipes out Ottawa, which is the easternmost node, and Guelph, which is the westernmost node, 420 kilometers apart, I don't think digital preservation is going to be a concern. It's going to be sort of water, power, you know, society, civil, civil, you know, civil discord. I mean, we're going to be like wearing skins and hunting bears uh, if that happens. So I really don't think that's, that's, I think it's overrated to sort of say they have to be further apart. Anyway. Pass it over to Nick, who's going to talk about the uh, the technology that's behind this. Like, 
uh, you see the York QT nodes, what I was just saying, are connected to GTA Net, which they go to Orion, and then our other nodes are out at um, Queens, uh, University of Art, uh, Ottawa, uh, Wealth. It was drawing for six, there's only five. Yeah, there's only five, yeah. 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 Sunday. Yes. Um, so, how do you access this thing? This is the thing that's talking about kind of difficult. Um, there's a variety of ways to do it. Uh, the first one is through the OpenStack Swift API, um, which kind of looks like this, which really you, you can't read this at all. Um, so, the first thing up in the left, what I'm do, I'm just, I want to walk through what I'm demonstrating here, is the, the command up at the left is a command called Swift Stat. Uh, there's a Python program called Swift. It's all the, the, the Swift API wrapper. Um, so that's just me saying, hey, what's the status of this? I'm giving it like my, my uh, authentication credentials, and I can connect fine. And the one on the left on the bottom is I'm just doing a list of a container I have in there, where I'm putting all the bag of bags. You can see them going in. And uh, the one on the top right, there's a really cool program called Arclone. Uh, so if you're familiar with rsync, our SCP, it's kind of like that. Um, so it can use the OpenStack uh, Swift API, it can use the Amazon API, you can use the Dropbox API. So you give it credentials and you can interact with it. So you can like list directories, you can move things, uh, you can upload things, you can pull things down, etc. So that's one way of interacting with it. This is a terminal window that might frighten people. Um, another way to interact with it is uh, there's a, a project called Swift Browser, and we've done some work with modification to it which is all up on GitHub. But basically, you hit this page, which is ORC.scholarsportal.info. Nobody here will be able to hit it because you have to be on a local IP address to hit this. You log in, you give it its credentials, but then you get a nice web interface uh, where you can browse through your container or your tenant. Uh, you can see the containers in your tenant. So I just have stuff set up here for our Archive Manga integration. Uh, our bags and a research project that we're working on. And one of the things I mentioned earlier is that like the five gigabyte limit. Um, if you're uploading files over five gigabyte, it'll automatically segment it. So that's why you see the things that uh, underscore segments. So it'll break it up into smaller files that you reassemble bring it back down. And this is just going further into a bag and looking what we have. Um, so what's the current state of it? Uh, I mentioned we had that, or Dale mentioned we had that kind of happy uh, funding accident, which is we built it out. Uh, we had 1.2 petabyte of that, um, but that's segmented into two different projects. Uh, the ORC, which is the thing we're talking about, uh, is just 300 terabyte of dedicated uh, for the original 11 partners, and each partner gets a 20 terabyte container. Um, and utilization thus far is poor. I think the master is winning. Yeah, with, with the most uh, stuff in there. I have some stuff in there. Uh, and UAT is, is, is using it a bit. Other than that, none of the other institutions that signed up to be partners for this have really made use of it yet. Um, the other one petabyte, or almost one petabyte, which we will <coughs> really talk about moving forward, is uh, for U of T. Uh, it's to support digital scholarship and other projects. And it's not geographic. What replicator? So all of those nodes, those five nodes, it's just 300 terabyte. That's it. So uh, work in progress. Uh, I'll talk about what we're doing at York, and then Dale will take over and talk about costing, and then I'll come back in there. Um, so what we're using it for at uh, York is bag storage. Uh, so intermediate stuff that we haven't put into our preservation repository, which is not in York instance, uh, we'll just put them up in here uh, in bags. I've done a lot of back and forth between do I put in just a raw bag or do I put in a serialized bag. Uh, serialized bags work a little bit better, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we've also recently, you we saw that Archive Manica container, it's at zero uh, bytes. Um, it's actually not zero bytes anymore. We finished the integration last week. Um, so if you use Archive Manica, uh, they have a Swift plugin. So you can open up the Swift and you can put your ape. Uh, storage there, so our ape storage for <coughs> Magnetic is living there, and that's uh, it's part of our, our preservation workflow uh, where we put things that we need to accession quickly. It goes to our Magnetic that lives here, and then when we're ready to curate it, 
uh, a little bit more. It goes into Island Door. Uh, other things that we're working on uh, is figuring out how to uh, hook us up to Fedora 4 and how we want to do it. Do we want it to be our um, like live, uh, like hitting, hitting Fedora 4 live, or do we want it to be like a second level of storage? Uh, so have it spinning disk and also have it uh, replicated here. Uh, you can hook it up to Bacula. Uh, so the cool thing about OpenStack is it's very, very similar to the S3 API, so there's a lot of stuff out there. So we can integrate it with Bacula. Uh, we're experimenting with just using it as just uh, a backup place. And then we're also exploring partnerships with uh, Central IT at York University around the research life cycle. Um, so we it up to uh, own cloud service for the faculty. And yeah. Uh, so as, as Nick alluded to, we've got about, uh, at McMaster, we've got about 14 terabytes sitting out of our 20 terabyte container, which makes us, and I'm going to say this with sort of a pride, uh, but also irritation, uh, which makes us the, the heaviest user, besides Scholar's Portal itself, of the OLARC. And what, what, I, what I should mention is that we had, we had what, like York and I think other partners, we had a bit of a, okay, what now moment? You know, we got this storage, it's object storage, we hadn't really worked with object storage before, we made a couple of mistakes about putting stuff out there, but we decided to really simplify things and not put a whole bunch of digital preservation thinking and policy in front of putting things on the array. If you have assets at risk like we did, you know, sitting in one data center, um, you know, just waiting for a pipe to burst and, and flood the whole thing, you know, it's better to write it out to the array and then worry later about what you're doing. Um, so we played around with our clone and we finally figured out um, you know, how to use it. Um, so the, seven, the 14 terabytes we have out there, as I've got on the screen, are pretty basic. So seven terabytes of it is just a raw archive, mostly from one uh, donation. So we, a number of years ago, we got the double-edged sword donation of a huge media archive from a Toronto media company. And so it was this huge press release and it was a big deal. But it's turned into a kind of a man. <laughs> you know the story. Uh, it's going to turn into this major albatross around your neck. What to do with this stuff? They just give us hard drives full of files that will take years, years for an archivist to sort out on our job in, in, in my area. But well, we've got to do something with them. So we just literally, we don't even bag it. It's just, it's just raw data as it comes off the drive we put out there. But at least those seven terabytes aren't just sitting on a shelf down in our archive anymore on, on a disk array. Uh, we replicated our entire digital archive, so our digitized materials. Um, out to the array, and the last terabyte is largely our eSpace IR and uh, our OJS instance where we publish a number of journals. So we did this after about you know, two and a half hours of discussions. We had these little meetings about every five or six weeks, uh, a group of four of us, where I set a bunch of tasks. Next time we come back and say, have we done those tasks? And we set more tasks. So putting these 14, 14 terabytes out there weren't exactly the work of you know, a committee and hours and hours of, of testing. I won't say that what we're doing is preservation. That's an important point. We are still working toward calling this preservation. We keep coming up, and if you haven't, I think a lot of us, I've had a lot of conversations here already, a lot of us aren't really doing preservation. We're just talking a lot about preservation. And so as we move things out there, we're beginning to ask ourselves questions like, what does preservation look like? You know, is it just a matter of cloning it every 30 days? DSpace, for example, of course, will do a lovely version of versioning. Are we really going to preserve all the versions of an object, or do we only care about the last submitted? What's the intellectual content? What's the point of preservation? So we're making some decisions around those kinds of questions. But again, we're not freighting that up with a lot of uh, concern about the, the details. So moving into, into cost, um, the good news in terms of our cost is that Scholars Portal is an established entity, a funded entity, and a staffed entity, as I mentioned. A vocal. So that provides a lot of overhead for us. We don't have to operate all of this hardware in the system by ourselves. Um, we have pretty good partners hosting the, the, the arrays, and we have others who are ready to take the, take the load up if certain partners have conditions change where they can no longer host a node or want to do major charge back, chargebacks. Um, McMaster, for example, we're not a node because of the time we lack the bandwidth, but you know our door is open. We run our own, the library runs its own data center. We can rack a node in about five minutes and, and be back in business. Um, and we also have the history of Opal as if, as if, I mean, Nick and I would probably, you know, over beer laugh about this a little bit, but compared to most consortia I've worked in, Opal is pretty happy and pretty collaborative and pretty much action-oriented just in terms of getting things done. So that model is something we can build on, and that helps with keeping the costs down. So the questions we asked ourselves is, 
who's going to pay and how much are these people going to pay. So we break them into, into pieces. They're the original partners, the original 11. Um, and there, there are the other local institutions, the other 10 that weren't part of the original. There's other non-Ontario institutions, so the rest of Canada, frankly the rest of the world, but really we're thinking mostly Canadian at this point. And then researchers, so people who are not coming through the libraries, but just research teams at universities who need large amounts of uh, replicated storage. Um, to build the cost model, just a citation of the source, Nick, I, Nick was a big part of it. I was sort of a, a traveler on this. Um, it's based a lot on Ralph and Goldstein's model in this article, um, with reservations. That this, is, this article has both been praised and, and criticized for its model, but it is a model and it is a useful model for generating numbers. And as I talk to more and more people about costs, and I had a, bit of a conversation last night with uh, Matthias Ratzel, and once again, he mentioned a number, and our number sort of lined up, and I was like, okay, different methodologies, but we're all landing at about the same price, which is somehow encouraging. Um, the other thing is we kind of made some, some conservative estimates. We didn't, we didn't try to set the price low based on optimism, but rather raise it up because of pessimism. Um, so we, we calculated in, in partner costs, um, as if they were charging back to the project certain things that they're doing, which they are not at this point, but if they were be to begin doing that, um, we decided to calculate those in. Um, took a very conservative approach to the annual decrease in storage costs. Of course, Kreider's Law is no longer holding, but storage is dropping faster than we allow for in the model. And we also assumed a five-year hardware refresh cycle. And I, I doubt we're the only ones in the room to say that, you know, if you take care of your, your racked hardware, you're going to get more than five years. But we assume a five-year refresh cycle on all this Dell hardware, knowing that it's probably going to actually push six or seven. Um, another thing, all the numbers I'm showing, this is always really important when so we're talking about numbers, I'm not talking US dollars, I'm talking Canadian dollars, and one, you know, Canadian dollar is not Euro, it's also not a US dollar, so, you know, do the math in your head, convert it to your currency and go, okay, these people are crazy, or they're not, and these numbers make sense. So, yeah, just do a quick conversion. So, for OCO members, and we're no longer distinguishing so much between people who were the original partners and the other 10, um, the annual subscription rate for a terabyte would be three hundred and twenty dollars, um, with a five terabyte minimum. And that's uh, I'll say more about that in, in terms of for, <laughs> forcing buy-in to the to the, the cloud. Uh, and then of course a slight discount if you're buying it in, in large chunks, a volume discount. And if you've looked at prices such as uh, Oracle has their new glacial-like service, I forget what they call it. They might just call it Oracle Cloud with some ridiculous. Uh, you know, 0.001 cent per gigabyte per year price, something like that. Um, but if you look at its price, if you want a terabyte with no restrictions on, on ingest or egress, uh, it's about, I think it's 360 US per year. And so suddenly these numbers begin to not sound so far apart from each other. Um, oh, and, and, and a note about cost too is currently the only distinction between the partners and the non partners is that we're not charging ourselves now. So none of us have paid for the storage yet at all. We're still living on that borrowed money that came from the funding action. So we are free. But if other, uh, other non-partners want to use storage right now, we would charge them uh, the second they come in. For non-local members, it jumps to 790. And this is, this is a very much a number that's a work in progress. And it represents, essentially, the, the base price of 320 plus network costs, plus a higher charge for hardware refresh. Because we, as, as OCO members, pay a certain amount to Scholars Portal to support their technology already. So we already subsidize their technology operation. Uh, for a non oco member, of course, we would go full, full charge and throw it out there. And when you compare this to you know, uh, some of the other storage services out there, uh, DuraCloud, uh, going to S3 Direct, uh, certainly Deepin, uh, 790 per terabyte per year doesn't sound quite so, so terrible. Again, it would be a five terabyte minimum of 3950. And these, you know, these things, this sounds like a price sheet that I'm putting out here, but people ask us, well, what if we're a really small institution, whether within OCO or without OCO, where five terabytes would be more than they would ever need? I mean, we're not, we're not a vendor. You know, we'll negotiate, we'll talk to people. Um, the idea is to get people doing the right thing and for us not to go broke doing it or subsidizing anyone to do it. So that sounds really simple, but there are some, some serious questions that, that we have not answered. One is the simple one, when do we let others access the storage? When do we drop, you know, we have to have a price we can charge them, so when do we drop the, the rope and let people come in and, and use the storage besides ourselves? When we do that, how broadly do we throw it open? It, it sounds, again, it sounds fairly simple. If they're an OCO member, we 
have sort of an agreement, an existing business arrangement. It's quite simple to let the other local institutions in. But when we begin going to Alberta, or if we begin crossing the border, we have some serious questions, and uh, we don't really have a good answer for those things. Again, we're not a vendor. We don't have a business department to sort these things out. We have to answer it ourselves. One of those key questions is, do we sell it directly? Do we become a quasi-vendor, or do we just sort of offer our storage through an existing uh, entity that already sells pumpkin storage, Durapod would be the, the most obvious one, perhaps. And the last one is, will, other, will others replicate this? You know, If we go out and do this, will others step in and sort of carve away what might be a market? Um, and in which case, so if we make cost calculations based on reselling some of it, and say Alberta decides to build the, the Allark, you know, the, their own research cloud, uh, does our business model fall apart? And the maybe the big question, is maybe two big questions here, is what, what should a terabyte of preservation capable, I'm not going to say preservation ready or preservation storage, but preservation capable storage cost? Should it be $10, you know, these lost leader uh, silly things like Glacier and or Oracle Cloud? Or should it be $4,000? And that's not an arbitrary number if you know what deep in charges for its, for its base membership. So somewhere between $10 and $4,000 is, is the proper number. But that's a pretty wide range. And you can err on, on either side of this, but you know, there's got to be a price that you, you need to pay to sustain these things, to create enough revenue to be part of a refresh, to grow these arrays. Um, so somewhere between 10 and 4,000 is the right number. I think we're on the right end of that by being you know, sort of in the bottom quarter, uh, but that's a very, very open question. And I think that this is one of the reasons we want to talk about this here, is just to sort of put this question out into the world. So uh, what, what's the purpose of this committee? 
Um, and I put it on here, uh, and I might just read it. Um, it supports the operation and future development of uh, the source cloud, so ORC. And it makes recommendations to the Oval Executive regarding the plans, mission, goals, policies, operations, and development of the storage cloud, including possible partnerships with non institutions. Um, so the thing here is like this committee lives in the local government structure, which then uh, uh, works with and reports to the Opal Executive Committee. And the Opal Executive Committee consists of, is it just the university librarians from the 21 institutions? Yeah. So there's 21 uh, institutions in Opal, so there's 21 university librarians, and the Opal Executive is a subset of those uh, directors. What else does it do? It facilitates informed decision making on the part of current and future members. It develops and reviews annual, uh, an annual storage pricing model for local members and non local clients. So, this costing work we just went through is not like we do it once and we're done. We got to look at this a lot and update it as things change. Um, considers reviews and approves usage and operational policies for the storage cloud as recommended by Scholars Portal staff. So this is a combination of what existed as the technical committee and working with scholars portal staff who work for support for this. Uh, and so getting usage policies around this and how we can use it. So there's a lot of working through like how can you actually use this? Can you run a live production website off of it? And at first it was, it was, it was verboten, uh, but now you can do it uh, due to a lot of robust testing uh, on the team. Uh, so this goes back to you, right? Yeah. Yep. So it all sounds like puppies and kittens, you know, we've got this production array and everything's going great. Um, and, but I, I want to sort of outline some of the some of the challenges and issues that we have. So one is we, we really need to develop these tools and documentation for existing tools. And, and Nick's made some very some very strong points uh, sort of on the, on the committee about the fact that we've set this up and now we can all go through the API and get there. And so schools such as York and McMaster where we have the staff who can deal with object storage uh, can go great guns and put lots of things out there, but there's, there are going to be a lot of these schools, even in the core partner group, that need simpler tools. They need direct integration of, of Archive Attica, they need direct integration of DSpace, things like that. Um, and we, we have sort of hit a roadblock there. We don't really have a roadmap. And more importantly, we don't really have commitments from any of the partner, partners to, to expend any of their, their development resources developing these tools. So we, we've got to do something uh, in that regard. Um, so that, you know, in other words, people need to contribute, not just uh, sort of come along for the ride. And, and the, there are people out there who have expertise, but they're not, they're not externalizing it. And so we're, we're guilty of that too. We've, we've written all this data out there, but haven't really said much publicly about how we did it or how we're going to do it. Um, Something else we've observed within uh, the network is, is an overemphasis on policy. And I'll, I'll put this one up um, as a librarian to sort of the, this is librarianing the, the project to death. Um, so, so three of the partners, for example, um, have a sort of mini uh, consortium amongst themselves. And uh, one of the questions that came from them, not long after we were in the production, which, which was really one of those space ball moments where you just want to sort of put down the phone, walk out of your office, go outside, scream, come back, sit down, and answer the question was, hey, do we have, this was three universities who were all partners. Now, I'm going to just do the math here. There were 11 partners who all got 20 terabytes. If three partners are sitting together, how much storage do they have? <laughs> and this is like basic math, 60 terabytes. The first question they asked was, 20, you know, do we have 20 terabytes because we're a trio, or do we have 60 terabytes? Literally, but if you're asking these questions, you're kind of asking the wrong questions. And then the next question that came was, uh, are you developing any policies about how are you using the storage? I was like, our policy is to use the storage. Our policy is not to put policies in front of using the storage, like forbidding certain files to go out there because they don't fit certain categories. So they were sitting down and writing this huge policy document before they had written a single megabyte to the array. They didn't know anything about it. They didn't know how to use it. They never touched it. But they were going to write policies to govern how they were going to use it. And they were all worried about these sort of fanciful use cases. Well, what if researchers come along and want to put you know, five terabytes up there? What are we going to charge them? How are we going to manage those transfers? I'm like, when that problem comes along, you might consider solving it at that time. But right now, you have things, you have assets. Your library has assets, I assume, if it's doing its job. 
that are at risk. They are not in preservation right now. So what are you going to do to get them there? So this overemphasis on policy has become a, a major, major uh, problem. And like I said, they're, like I said on the slide, they're worrying about scenarios that may or may not ever materialize. But I can guarantee that they have risks that they need to mitigate. And that should be the emphasis, um, at least those of us who are actually using the storage feel this way. So we did a really good job of coming to, to collaborate, coming together to, to build it. But we need to extend that now to, to using it and developing tools. And we haven't gotten there yet. Um, I think we're going to have to, and this is something that sits ill with the people who aren't using it, ironically. They're not using it, and yet they're protecting it. You know, it's ours, we don't want to give up the space. Um, those of us who are using it and watching people not using it say, well, we need to let others start using it sooner rather than later. We need to let the rest of Ontario in. We need to let the rest of Canada in if they want to pay the price. Um, and frankly, just yesterday I was having a conversation with people about, you know, if you were in the U.S. and you're an institution, would you like to put your assets on the Canadian server? political climate. And that sounds really ridiculous and fanciful, but when you think about preservation and some of the things that David Rosenthal has said about regimes falling and rising, um, it's, it's maybe not quite so quite so crazy. It might also just be a cost consideration. And right now the Canadian dollar is worth you know, nothing. Um, so it would be a very cheap uh, storage solution compared to some of the other alternatives. And, and we need to really uh, nail down this, this future governance within Opal. If people are part of this, this standing committee, they need to actually commit to the committee and just do more than get a quarterly phone call and occasionally take minutes and post them online. They need to actually obligate themselves to do uh, some of the work of doing this. So we'll stop there, take questions. Um, just wanted to put some names up there. People who were a big part of uh, building it also demonstrates sort of the, the inherent strength of the local and scholars portal that we could you know, pull out on this kind of expertise to build this. So that's all we have to say and happy to take questions.